Okay, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, and greetings to everyone from wherever you may be. Um, I am Priya, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Prime World Tour Research Paper Development Workshop 2022. Um, as you know, the Prime World Tour Research Paper Development uh, Program is made possible by a generous partnership between Prime and two of the world's leading international journals in responsible management and business in society field, which is business and society and journal of business ethics. And today the regional uh, prime chapter ASEAN is proud to co-host this workshop with the School of Business, Monash University, Malaysia. Um, so as chair of prime chapter ASEAN, I would like to first uh, and foremost, thank Andrew and Premila for leading our chapter in organizing this significant workshop. Um, I would also like to thank the ASEAN Committee, Emmy from uh, De La Salle University, uh, Loga from Monash University, Malaysia, um, and Enrico from Chulalongkorn University. So thank you for, uh, you know, helping and putting this together um, within the time that we did. I just want to say that one thing that stood out in our efforts is the generosity of spirit we saw from everyone involved. Thank you to the keynote speaker, to the panelists and mentors for contributing so selflessly despite being on vacation, some of you, and um, you know, uh, coming together during the challenging time zones. Um, so we are truly inspired by your leadership. Uh, we have 174 registered participants and 30 papers and project ideas that will be given feedback by 15 mentors who are all editors and co-editors from these high-ranked journals. Thank you again for your uh, kindness and generosity. I would also like to thank the School of Business, Monash University, Malaysia for co-hosting. And I would like to invite Professor uh, Nafis As. Uh, Nafis Alam, who is our head of school, to say a few words. Thank you, Priya. And first of all, I would uh, I was very happy to see that people are joining from different time zones and all over the world. That's very encouraging to see people are uh, attending at 11 or 2 a.m. in the different time zones. And that, that shows the importance of this event, uh, Priya. So it, it's really heartening to see that uh, uh, this workshop is going to be a fruitful one. So um, uh, my name is Nafis and I'm very pleased to see so many of you this uh, afternoon here and somebody was commenting earlier, yes, we had a blackout in KL and I was worried that what will happen uh, during the session, but I think we have been slowly getting back to normal, the uh, power is back on campus and maybe in the whole KL as well. Uh, I understand that, you know, the, the uh, SDG and responsible management has taken a big, big uh, leap in the in the business education. And a lot of uh, academics and researchers are looking to work in this area. And especially the initiative of Prime, along with the AACSB as well, which promotes the responsible management and work within the uh, responsible education as well as the SDG goal is very important. It was so heartening to see that uh, uh, the Prime uh, ASEAN chapter has given the School of Business this opportunity and I'm very proud that uh, uh, Priya is taking a lead and the school is able to host the uh, ASEAN leg of this uh, World uh, Tour Research Development Workshop. Uh, I understand that uh, this is uh, going to be a very fruitful event for the next couple of hours and the discussion will lead to some top quality papers in the area of responsible management and SDG. I think uh, <laughs> all these uh, contributions will go a long way because at the end of the day, we all as an educator are here to change how the business uh, work and how we are contributing back to the community and the society. So a big uh, round of applause for every one of you who have joined this afternoon, uh, local time. So I would also like to extend my heartiest uh, thanks uh, to the Prime Secretariat uh, to allowing us to host this event uh, along with the organizing committee. A uh, special thanks to Andrew uh, to, to moderate this session and giving us the opportunity to host this session uh, 
Joshan was here earlier. I hope he's still around. So thanks for giving your speech, Joshan, and, and trying to uh, encourage some of the participants here to uh, publish in the mainstream journal. Uh, I would also like to extend my best wishes to all the people who have been involved in this, uh, uh, this, this world tour, uh, especially the names uh, which have been prominent, Pramila from India, uh, Enrico, Loga, Emilina, and definitely Priya, who has been working tirelessly on this. I can see that she's so excited and passionate about working in the area of uh, prime as the responsible management education. Uh, a big thanks to uh, for most of the people who work in the area of responsible management ethics and also uh, and business and society journal and the two top class journal in this area of uh, speciality and i hope that uh, on the conclusion of this uh, workshop uh, we can see more papers and uh, a more research oriented on that i wish i could have hosted many of you physically uh, in KL, but uh, maybe the next leg of this event or maybe the next session of this event, uh, Priya, please uh, make it a physical event and we would be happy to see so many, so many smiling faces uh, in physical here. So I wish everybody a productive next couple of hours. Uh, I would have loved to stay back and enjoy the session as well, but I have a school exco meeting, which I have delayed for 10 minutes just to attend this session. So uh, have a productive uh, workshop and uh, uh, enjoy the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nafis, uh, and thank you for your support um, in all that we are trying to do around responsible management education. I would now like to invite Andrew Crane, who's our chair, the chairman of the PWT uh, organizing committee. Thanks so much, Priya. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here and to join you all in our event today. Um, I mean, basically, the, the idea of the event is to, as Nafis was saying, you know, to, to help people publish. Um, we, we're all doing great research around the kind of topic of responsible management. Uh, everyone on this call is probably doing research in some kind. We all face struggles in, in publishing that work. And we all face struggles in getting it into ever better and more prestigious journals. And... We also face struggles in making sure that our work not only gets published, but also has an impact in the world, right? Where we're all passionate about this topic for a reason. And it's not just to further our careers, but also to, to make a difference in some way. So as we're gonna go through the workshop uh, during uh, this afternoon or this morning, this evening, wherever you are, we're going to talk about these different things and, and talk about some of the ways in which we can improve our chances of getting published, but also to provide perhaps some inspiration uh, for us all for what we might achieve and, and what we might aim for. So just to give you a sense of how this is gonna to work today, um, we will first off, our first couple of hours is for everybody that's in the, in the event today, it's an open event. And we're gonna have our keynote talk by Yuck and Rev, and then we're going to have our editors panel where we get the chance to talk to a range of different co-editors and associate editors of journals. And then we're going to break. And then those of you that have submitted papers and got accepted into the workshop, then we, we go into breakout sessions where we where you get kind of direct feedback from some of our mentors about your work in progress with the idea that we can all learn from, from each other, right? It's not a matter of kind of experts and novices, it's a matter of us all that of peer review and kind of learning from each other. And so during these sessions, we'll all be giving each other feedback on, on the works in progress. Um, as you'll have noticed, uh, Priya started the recording. So please be aware that we are recording. So if you have any problems uh, in terms of that, then please make sure you stay off camera or off mic. Um, but in general, if you would keep your cameras on, that'd be great. It's lovely to see the different faces uh, from across the region here, um, but mics off so that we don't get too much interference. And the event today is, is our ASEAN Plus uh, stop on the Prime Research Workshop World Tour. And so we're doing a whole series of eight workshops over these two years uh, in different parts of the world to try and bring these ideas of, of how can we improve our kind of publishing and impact performance to a range of different communities of prime communities around the world. Our first one was in Brazil. 
This one is in ASEAN Plus, hosted in Malaysia here. Um, and following that, we're going to have our next ones this year will be in North America and in Europe. So we're getting around, but as Nafi said, um, we're not getting around. We're not flying around at, at this stage. We're, we're mainly doing these in it, 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 online, um, obviously to save all our carbon footprints and everything else, and to make sure that we get some, you know, some, some great participation from, from across different regions. Um, I think that's probably all I need to do in terms of getting us started. What I will say is, We've already started using the chat. Please carry on using the chat. That's wonderful. Uh, this is supposed to be a conversation. Um, we you know, post questions, uh, post comments as we're going through. You know, don't be shy about doing so. There are no stupid questions uh, amongst peers, right? We all want to. We all want to learn. There will always be other people thinking the same things that you are. And. Um, what, what we'll probably do is when we get into the Q&A, both for the, um, for the keynote and for the editor's panel, if you're happy to do so, we'll also ask you to come on camera and to, and to ask questions and make comments uh, in that way as well. So um, I think by way of introduction, that's enough. And we are at 2.15, so we should move over into our first main part of the workshop, which is our keynote speaker. And our speaker today is Jochen Reb, Professor Jochen Reb, uh, who's a professor of organizational behavior and human resources um, at the uh, Singapore Management University in the Lee Kong Chian School of Business. And Jochen's also the director of the Mindfulness Initiative uh, at SMU, um, where they do work you know, researching around mindfulness. And Jochen's done some really fantastic scholarly work around this topic, but also um, the, I think the idea of, of Jochen being involved in this topic is because he believes passionately about it and how and the kind of positive benefits it can bring to us all. And so he's going to talk to us today about some of the research that he's done, but also about the kind of how we can conduct research that helps people, uh, helps make a positive difference in the world, have a positive impact um, beyond just getting your publications in good journals. So uh, Jochen, um, I saw that you were there. We are going to hand it over to you. And Priya, I presume it's going to be easy enough for Jochen to share his slides. Yes. To share his screen. Um, so Jochen, okay. over to you. OK, thank you so much, Andrew, for the introduction. And then Priya also, right? And everyone. Um, um, it's uh, an honor to be to be invited to speak to you. Um, I realize I'm in between you, uh, the the now and the more interesting part of this workshop. Right? I think this is great. It's a great thing to have these paper development workshops. I've participated in them repeatedly. I always uh, really enjoyed them, the exchange of ideas and so on. So uh, I'll I'll try not to take up too much of your time, and I hope there's going to be something interesting in there for you. Um, as Andrew introduced, it, it's, it's a bit of a, in a way, a case study uh, about my own um, work, but, but um, you know, and how I got to, to get into this mindfulness initiative at SMU that Andrew mentioned. But, but please don't think that, you know, I think, or you should think that my story is anything special. Uh, you know, all of you, you know, can, can do great research and, and can have great impact, right? You know, in, 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 in a variety of different ways, right? And this is, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about my uh, kind of story, my development, but again, without implying that there's anything unique or special or something like that, but hopefully it's gonna be a bit, uh, it could motivate you. I, I do, as Andrew mentioned, I do strongly believe that, um, you know, we almost have like an obligation to have, well, we have an obligation, I, I do believe, to have try to make some kind of a positive impact right, beyond publishing our papers, which is also a very important part, of course, of our job, but we'd like to do a bit more when we can do so through teaching, of course, but also in other ways. And I feel like for mindfulness, an area that I, you know, have been uh, engaged with for a long time, that's maybe even more important as I tried to indicate in the title, because in mindfulness, you can talk about it all day long, but you kind of, to understand it, you kind of have to practice it. So practice is almost implied 
in this uh, in this in this concept, you know, um, practice of mindfulness. So given that, uh, given that we have to practice mindfulness, and <laughs> I hope you don't mind if I invite you to join uh, me in, in like a one minute or two minute present uh, practice of mindfulness, if that's okay. There's nothing spiritual or religious about it, uh, right? So don't don't worry about that. And of course, you don't have to join if you don't want to. I would say that uh, it's completely optional, but I'd like to introduce the short stop practice. Yeah, if that's okay. So stop stands for S for stop whatever you're doing. T for take a deep breath. O for observe the natural flow of breathing. And P proceeding with whatever you're doing, hopefully with a sense of calmness and curiosity. Yeah. So shall we do that right now? Yes. Okay. So please stop whatever you're doing, uh, except listening to me. <laughs> but if you're still checking your emails or anything like that on the side, uh, I'd like to ask you to just stop. If you like, you can close your eyes or you can keep them open. It's completely up to you. And just take a deep breath in and relaxing as much as we can as we breathe out. And then for just a minute, letting go of everything else, giving ourselves a bit of time and space to be with ourselves. While we just observe the natural flow of breathing, not trying to breathe in any particular way, just observing and nothing else to do. And whenever the mind gets distracted, gently bringing it back to the observation of the breath. Okay, I promise to keep it short. So we'll end it here. Just checking in how we're feeling right now. Maybe there's a bit of sense of calmness. And then whenever you're ready, opening the eyes again, if you have closed them and proceeding with the session. Well, thank you for joining me. So, um, yeah, so your experience might be very different, right? But maybe even in the short session, you notice something, right? It's different than talking about mindfulness, right? <laughs> I feel like every time I do it, right, I'm still, it's kind of fascinating. Um, you know, the experience is different. Oftentimes, it also has some similarities. Um, there's a lot of variation between different people, right? And you're welcome in, to share in the chat also how you felt. Some of you said it was nice, some feeling calm. And Esther, Esther love this, thank you, right? Um, clear our mind, full attention, Daniel, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a practice you can do you know, during the day if you're feeling agitated or frustrated, you know, something's not going well or you're anxious or so, and, and you can do that deeply. Note that I can't promise you it always works. <laughs> and uh, so sometimes people feel, you know, they, they don't feel better at the end, right? We are not like machines or anything like that. Right? Um, so, but oftentimes it works in a shorter period of time. It works in the sense that, you know, it makes us a bit calm and relaxed. Right? So peaceful, uh, yes, but not on, right, as you're sharing. So, so, yeah, so, you know, I feel like um, this is very, very important part of um, what I'm doing is not just the research, but also, also the practice, right? And I think, um, you know, that, that goes to these questions that I ask myself also, and increasingly also, um, I think maybe as I'm, as I'm getting older, but it's great that you guys are already like 
at this stage, a lot of you are still, uh, you know, younger, um, wondering about, you know, um, you know, important questions. Right? Um, so this, this is great. Because I think that these are questions that we should ask, right? Um, because sometimes uh, I feel like, unfortunately, um, too much still we're having like a, almost like a closed circle where we are speaking among ourselves as scholars. And that conversation is very important, but it's also a relatively small community. So I do think we can ask ourselves and we should, you know, how can we speak to, to a broader community and to other communities also, and how can we be relevant and, and, and make a positive impact? Yeah, so. Personally, let me just again share a little bit about um, how that developed for me. Uh, you know, I, I started with meditation and mindfulness. For some reason, I got into it, interested in that. I'm a, I'm a German, right? Um, but for some interest, for some reason, I was interested in Eastern, Eastern philosophies as a teenager, and then I did a, a, an exchange studies in Japan for a year, and I started to get into Zen meditation. Uh, funnily enough, I was at a Jesuit university, and there was a Jesuit father and philosophy professor and uh, who was teaching Zen. So I, I started more, you know, get more uh, interested and involved with that, with the practice. And as a PhD student, I saw the research on mindfulness in, uh, in psychology, in clinical uh, psychology and medicine. And uh, I, I wanted to start to look at it in a, in, a, in a workplace context also. That's where I started to do some academic research on mindfulness towards the end of my PhD. Uh, studies. It wasn't so popular at the time, the whole concept of mindfulness, right? Um, there was still uh, much, much less going on. Um, but I thought it was very interesting to look at self-regulation, right? Self-regulation of our attention, of our emotions, of our behavior. I just thought that's a fascinating topic. Um, so I started slowly. I also have research on decision-making that was more mainstream, um, but then I started slowly on the mindfulness research together with others. Right, and uh, published some papers in that space. Um, and then at some point I felt like, well, you know, so I have a personal practice and I publish some papers, uh, you know, what's the next step, right? And that's where I felt like, you know, well, I should do more uh, like outreach, bring it into education. And then that's when, uh, you know, we got together with some others with, within Singapore Management University and started a mindfulness community. And out of that community came the mindfulness initiative at SMU as like a formal kind of institutionalized kind of uh, effort at SMU, right? Um, and, and I thought that kind of, you know, really, you know, created a nice situation of win-win um, where, you know, I think the, the research really helps the practice. Right, um, so I see them as very closely connected. Right, I mean it informs the practice and it also legitimizes, I think, the mindfulness at work uh, kind of thing. Right, because especially early on there was a lot of concerns. You know, do we really need this? Uh, what's the evidence for this? Is this just some kind of esoteric, uh, fluffy stuff? Right, um, and then you know, and then it's easy to dismiss it. Right, and there's a lot of worries and concerns and and, and so on. So I think the research is very very important. Right, to the extent that we can show, hey, there is some evidence uh, that this matters. Of course, we know science, you know, is always work in progress and it's not the final word, word on, on things and there can be new research findings, but at least there's some evidence, right? Some emerging support for, in, the, in my case, for the mindfulness as a practice. So I do think that helps a lot. Um, at the same time, I also find that, uh, you know, practicing education and outreach is important uh, for, for uh, inspiring some research, informing research, giving ideas for research, um, and also uh, as a way of finding meaning in, in my career for me right, as a scholar. So I just find it so enriching, right, um, that we know publishing can be hard, right? So, you know, we, we write on a paper, it takes a long time, you know, we submit it, we get anonymous feedback. All these things can be kind of tough um, in a way of delayed gratification, right? They're not immediately we're getting positive feedback and a positive experience. So for me, um, when I do like a mindfulness workshop or course, 
it's a nice compliment because you're in a room together and for two hours and you practice mindfulness and you're sharing with each other and you can immediately see that at the end of the session, you know, kind of people feel better. <laughs> Many of them, right? most of them, in fact, um, you know, they, they, you see the immediate benefit. So it's very different from the publications. It's a bit more like teaching, right? But different again in the sense that it's less conceptual here, right? But whatever that is, but I think that just gives me meaning and satisfies me and also gives me motivation to do more research again, even when it's difficult, right? When you get a rejection right? and so on, and I mean, people don't like your work, um, that's okay, right? But uh, you, know, you have something else that kind of gives you some fuel and gives you some power, um, energy. So I feel like they go, these things go really well together. That's what I found from my personal experience. I didn't necessarily expect it beforehand but I did find that to be the case. I, so just very briefly, I don't wanna bore you with that, but also just to illustrate a few points. Um, early on when I presented, I was looking back in my CV now as preparing for, for this presentation. In 2006, I presented a paper at the Academy of Management and there it was on the early research on mindfulness and negotiation but I actually still call it concentration. <laughs> I guess I was uh, uh, worried that mindfulness and it's calling mindfulness would uh, uh, raise too many eyebrows or be rejected out hand. Um, so <laughs> I think kind of interesting to see. Um, then, you know, I think over time, then, you know, I started to call this more mindfulness and felt more confident, uh, right? Even though, you know, there was criticism about this, or oh, are you trying to bring religion into, uh, into the academy or something like that, right? Or there would be criticism from, from Buddhists and from meditation practitioners who said, oh, wow, what you call mindfulness is completely watered down. This is not the real mindfulness. So there's will always be some criticism, which I kind of have to recognize. That's okay, right? Different people have different perspectives on, on this. Um, that, that's totally legitimate. And I'm trying to kind of respect that also. Um, then there was also a teaching case, right? Uh, which is kind of interesting because I normally kind of tend to focus and be socialized into trying to publish in top tier journals. However, we did some interviews at a company, If Insurance, that uh, was doing a mindfulness training program. And so we went and interviewed the participants and also the non-participants and, the, and the, the, the bosses. And I have to say it was very, very interesting, right? Qualitative, uh, um, but I, I learned a lot from how people uh, uh, experience the mindfulness in the workplace setting. So here again, I think it, get, it told me that, you know, sometimes, you know, when you're passionate about a topic also, you know, you do some background work, look at it more broadly, right? Talk with people, uh, find out from practitioners what, how they think about it, how they experience it. And that was very useful as well for me, even though it didn't lead to a, like a publication in a journal, right? Or let alone a top tier publication, but I learned a lot, which helped me later on. Right. Um, I also was involved with PDWs at AOM, professional development workshops, and that was also kind of helpful and nice to bring a community together of people who are interested in it beyond SMU, but more now on a global scale within the academy. So uh, these kind of things are also something I recommend you. Right? They, they broaden your perspective, they connect you to other people. Right? And only you know, then over time did I actually manage to publish uh, research articles. It always takes some time, right? And these are not in top tier journals, but a lot in actually mindfulness, a journal that really publishes great work also in the area of mindfulness. And I think that that's also what was good. It was a very you know, suitable journal, although you know, not so high up for a business school ranking really, right? And then only later, right, um, towards the end, did I hit more like the mainstream kind of um, what we consider like top tier journals, right? Um, which, you know, as you know, I mean, there's so much good research in, in many, many journals even beyond that, right? I also edited a book, right? Um, that was also helpful. Um, you know, bringing together other scholars, um, you know, to, to, to publish a book together. And again, here a point was not only to survey and provide an overview of the research, but also to legitimize the field, right? Publishing with a good publisher, uh, Cambridge University Press in this case, I think it helped. And that was followed up uh, by a special issue on mindfulness at work in, in OBHDP. 
So, you know, a lot of kind of different efforts that we engaged in uh, with, with many other people to kind of push the work in this area, to establish it, bring it more into the mainstream as a topic also, and also and all again, providing um, some basis for evidence-based practice to provide some legitimate legitimacy for organizations to, to offer mindfulness programs and so on, right? So in our own way and, and small ways to try to contribute to that. Because so the research does suggest, of course, uh, that generally speaking, mindfulness brings a lot of benefits in mindfulness practice, even though you know we don't know the, the contraindications so well yet, and there are some and so on, but generally speaking, a lot of benefits. So we feel like it, it's a good thing and it's worth the effort to try to substantiate that more. Um, okay, so I don't want to bore you with this, but just to overview, right? So I did some work then on decision-making, how does mindfulness come into decision-making? So these are more like applied topics, right? Originally the mindfulness research was very much about clinical, clinical side, health, well-being, uh, how it works, helps with stress, anxiety, chronic pain, depression, relapse, prevention, and these more clinical topics. So now, you know, I and others, of course, we looked at things like mindfulness and decision-making, mindfulness and leadership. Are leaders who are more mindful, are they more effective? Are they seen as more effective? Are they, how are the employees doing? Are they benefiting from it? So the interpersonal side of mindfulness. So many interesting topics to study there. Um, negotiation, a topic I got in very early, which I was kind of thinking, that might not work, but then it turned out that we found repeatedly that negotiators who did a mindfulness practice, they performed better, both in win-lose distributive negotiations and also more recently in our OBHD paper in win-win negotiations where we found that mindful diets were more cooperative with each other and really reached more win-win agreements, right? So. So this was the research side, how it's developed over time, just to give you a sense of the journey. It was not a straightforward journey where, you know, you start off and you immediately, I immediately publish like in, in the top journals or something like that. No, it takes some time and that, that's also okay. I think the key is really to try to do good work that you can be happy with, uh, research that's ethical in itself also, right? Uh, um, and then, you know, have some patience and persistence. So along with that, then we started the mindfulness initiative at SMU. So I just show you a screenshot of, of the, the website, right? And then um, over time that has developed such that, you know, we can feature there our research, but we also offer courses. Uh, these are typically for the general public and we have practitioner, uh, participants from all walks of life, whether these are partly could be our students, work, working adults, uh, retirees, and so on, right? Singaporeans, expats. Um, we, we offer also some things for the communities or sometimes we offer series, speaker series or talks, some smaller conferences, some regular mind practice communities that get together uh, to practice mindfulness. Uh, and we even offer some teacher training. So that means we uh, train others to teach mindfulness courses, right? Because now with the increase in the demand for mindfulness training, uh, there's a lack of qualified uh, trainers also, right? And facilitators. So we got engaged in that as well to try to bring in some very senior teachers also and develop teacher training programs uh, in the region and also beyond globally where we have participants from, right? So these are all efforts that they didn't happen in one time. They just happened developed over time to bring in more and more people, uh, to bring in, to do more in a way slowly building up organically, do more uh, and try to hopefully, you know, reach more people in a positive way. The courses, then also in the teacher training, the money that we make, of course, it, it supports teachers, but it also supports research and PhD students, right? So if we have some surplus, we can fund the PhD students project on doing research and mindfulness or going to a conference or summer school and so on. So here again, I think I see the win-win and how they can benefit each other. So really, right, and, and this whole idea, right, of this integration is really features already in our vision and our mission, right, where it's, it's really about research, education, outreach, empowering, right, and trying to integrate these. These are not things that are in conflict with each other, I believe, not one or the other. Of course, somehow you have to manage your time and you can't do everything, 
but they do complement each other. Email sa ila nga dili mao taga ikong kuan. Nahi man day ang kuan ni. So as I said, right? Um, the the You can, you are muted. Oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Now, can you hear me again? We can, yeah. Okay. So, right. So, as I said, I think they, they mutually complement each other, right? Uh, the Mindfulness Initiative benefits from the research, which is kind of a thought leader, right? And evidence base, kind of, and so on. Um, the, the research benefits from the programs through the funding and then partly also through the ideas, partly through access, access to research participants from the program participants. Um, uh, we can also use the protocols and our experience in teaching mindfulness for interventions for research. Now, when we do more field of intervention research that we're doing more now, we can draw on our expertise in teaching mindfulness, facilitating mindfulness practices, right? And the feedback we got and the experiences. And of course, uh, organizations also see the Mindfulness Initiative as a university-based program that they can collaborate with either for, for training or also for research, and ideally for an integration of the two. So these are things really um, right, um, that have evolved over time. And uh, another point here is just, I try to make it also fit into a business school context. Right? I think I thought like, the clinical approach to mindfulness, it didn't fit so well in the business school, right? So, and also with my own interest. So I was thinking, well, like how, how, what is mindfulness in a business uh, context, in a workplace context? So the research topics are different and also partly the courses are different, right? We have a, we have a program that is called Mindfulness-Based Strategic Awareness Training that we work with the inventor creator of the program very closely. And that is really much more about decision-making uh, for generally healthy people who want to move more towards flourishing by making better decisions, right? Um, so that kind of really fits into the into the workplace context. So I think it's also the lesson for me was I, I learned and over time also, you know, you can be smart in adapting, kind of be flexible a bit in adapting. You don't have to do it exactly the way others have done mindfulness. Um, you can find your own way of doing that. Okay, right, so overall, um, right, I feel like, well, I went over this already, just to conclude um, and then open up for question and answers. Um, really, once again, I mean, that's fine, that's so important for me in that lesson, um, that research and practice and outreach, they are not mutually exclusive. They, are, they do compete for some time, but they really also enrich each other. Right? They are mutually supportive. Um, and the practical impact should complement scholarly impact and, uh, impact and the other way around, right? And we do have the scholars, right? I mean, we, we, as scholars, we do have the knowledge to inform practice. Maybe sometimes we don't realize that, right? And maybe we're, we're a bit too shy or so, or not confident enough and we think, oh, you know, how is this relevant? But I am convinced that all of you, are, you know, you can make that kind of impact, right? Because you learn a lot, you study a lot, right? Uh, something that practitioners often don't have the time for, right? And the luxury, in a way, for them it would be a luxury. So if you can go there, um, you can really provide something valuable to practice. Um, I recently was in Berlin at the Max Planck Institute, um, working with a co-author there, and just as I was there, there, there was the long night of the sciences, they call it there, which I think is an annual event. So they open up a lot of research centers and universities for the general public come in and then they do little demonstrations of research and experiments and so on. And it was great to end it in the evening and going into the night. And it was great to see that. Uh, it was really a lot of buzz and even the, the, the very senior people give talks, the Max Planck Institute directors, they give talks for the public. And the person I'm working with, Gerd Gigerenzer, He's very excited, right? His talk was about supposed to be for 30 minutes, but then it went way over time because a lot of questions and he stayed there afterwards, talked with people one-on-one. -on -one. And you know, even though he's a very, very busy person, does a lot of research, he's taking the time uh, to reach out. And you know, he's written a lot of books, also practitioner and the books. And so I, I really take that also him and others as an inspiration for me to say, hey, you know, even you know, people like that who, who have a great research career, um, they 
they, they don't see it as a waste of time. They see it in fact as part of their job, really, and, and part of their responsibility. And also they're often like excited about it. They enjoy interaction with, with practice and beyond the scholarly community. So overall, I would say, you know, start early, right? As you're doing, don't wait until you are tenured. Sometimes there's the advice, you know, or you can all do all the things that you're really passionate about after you have tenure. Uh, I don't believe in that. I think, you know, passion is important, right? Uh, because it gives you the energy to do good work. So, um, and the three Ps, I think the passion, as I mentioned, persistence, you do have to be realistic. I think you do have, need some persistence, right? Also uh, to go over the, the, the hurdles and the obstacles and the disappointments along the way. Um, so be persistent, don't give up and program. Try to do programmatic research, right? Uh, follow uh, that program, figure out what you want to do and then follow that path over a longer period of time. And I think that that tends to lead to success. I see that in many, many people. Great, so let me stop here and open it up for questions. It's okay. Thank you so much, Jochen. That was a wonderful and inspiring uh, kind of talk about some of the different ways in which you've managed to bring research and practice together. I mean, we had a, a bunch of questions came up in the chat, um, which were more about the kind of scholarship behind this, about your methodology and these types of things. Mm -hmm. So perhaps you've just spent a couple of minutes, you know, maybe elaborating uh -huh. a little bit on, on how you go about this research and how you go about doing this research well in a way yeah. that both gets you to hit some of these top journals that you were talking mm -hmm. about, but also yeah. does mm -hmm. research that's practically useful. You know, how much is yeah. the tension between doing those two things and, and how you actually go about designing your methodologies and that type of stuff? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so th this is, this. yes. Um, you know, I think, um it's all oh, so much about learning from others right what i've always done is just try to emulate great other papers also right it may be in a different research area um but i think okay oh this is this is a kind of the kind of paper that i liked to write right and these are this is a great method right and there you know i particularly look at top tier you know publications right because they kind of set the standards right uh so if you want to hit uh, a certain kind of like JBE, then, you know, you look at JBE papers and look how they're written, right? And what kind of methods they're using, right? And in my case, those papers were not on mindfulness, right? Because they didn't exist at the time, but uh, they were on other topics. And I also did the research on decision-making where there's much more work already in these, in the, in these best journals. So I kind of thought, you know, how uh, can I do a similar kind of work in, my, in this area of mindfulness, right? So what are the established methodologies? And what are the methodologies that I'm also good at, right? I really started off as an experimentalist. So I tried to draw on my knowledge about how to run experiments and bring that into the space of mindfulness. Right? So I think as a general rule, I think this is very, very important. You know, uh, when we're passionate about our topic, there could be sometimes we, 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 we think that everybody must like it just because we are so passionate about it and because it's so important. But that's not, in my experience, how other people see it because other people are typically not as passionate about, as you are about your most passionate topic. So think about the regular person, right? The regular reviewer and the regular reader of the journal, and you gotta kind of sell it to them, right? Uh, so, you, and that doesn't go by passion alone, right? So you have to think about what will be acceptable for them? What kind of methods will they appreciate? What kind of writing style will they appreciate, right? And what kind of literature should you connect to? So, you gotta be practical as well. I say maybe that's another P, right? I gotta be practical. So uh, I always try to find that intersection, right? Where I do things that I'm passionate about, but also other people could hopefully relate to it. And that I try to do by using more mainstream kind of methods, right? And I, that, that's just my choice, right? I know sometimes people in the mindfulness space and maybe some people also, then they, they really feel like, okay, this, this should be done in a different way, right? Maybe they think it's not, can be, cannot be done quantitatively, it should be more qualitative and so on. But I'm totally, I appreciate that point of view, but for me, that would not be the right way to proceed. I do feel like I wanna adjust to what the field is also expecting in terms of the methods and the rigor and, and, and so on. So look at, look at some great papers, uh, emulate those, look at the strongest methods that you can find and, and do really, really rigorous 
work on, on the method side, right? Because you got to be really strong in the methods, I think, if, especially if you have a topic that may not be the most you know, popular and well-established one at that time. Yeah, no, I think it's very wise advice. Um, we have a question from Ben Tihanki. Ben, do you want to uh, come on, on camera and, and speak to this one about uh, kind of objectivity and, and values? Or would you like me to read it out? Oh, okay. Ben. Oh, um, Ben, uh, hold on. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, I can... oh, what do you mean? You, oh, wait, hold on. Can you unmute yourself? Oh, there you go. I, I got it. So, yeah. 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 Uh, I was very inspired by your sharing. And I was thinking, uh, because some scholars have this classical expectation that researchers have to be detached, you know, almost, uh, well, as part of the objective uh, criterion. So, but I can feel your passion really for having an impact to see whether your findings apply in, in the world of practice. So how, how did you navigate that, that path? How did you manage, were, were there outright objections in the reviews of your paper or that was, how did you deal with that? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ben, that's a great question. Um, um, it's also something, I mean, that has been developing for me over time, right? My, my view on that. Um, first of all, I, I do not believe we should be detached in a sense. We, I, I do find that passion is very important. However, we have to be careful that passion does not lead to us um, trying to, of course, of course, we try to find certain things, but we have to be ethical in our research practices, right? And rigorous, right? So for me, what I always try to do is say, well, it's okay if mindfulness does not help, for example. And that's also useful to know. Mm. In fact, I think it's great to know. Uh, if mindfulness has any negative effects on certain people, for example, certain groups of people with certain, for example, uh, in certain conditions, that would be very, very important to know. Mm. Because mm. if we were teaching mindfulness to those people, mm. we would actually hurt those people, which is the least last thing I would like to do, right? Um, so, you know, if the research would find that mindfulness is actually a bad thing, oh, that, that would be good to know because then we shouldn't be doing it, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm not doing mindfulness for the sake of doing mindfulness, right? I'm doing, you know, you have to keep the final objective in mind. It's supposed to help people. If it's not helping people, there's no point in doing it, right? So I always feel like the truth is good to know, right? Especially in the long run, right? So, um, you know, I think that, that helped me a lot, right? So then I can see it more easily. Yes, I'm passionate about it, but it doesn't mean that have to be like you know blinding myself to potential negative consequences of it does that make that's sense that's such a great explanation i'll use that to explain to my students that they shouldn't be so obsessed with statistically significant findings because as researchers they should discover the truth yeah thank you yeah, thank yeah. you for that explanation um we have a question from vicky little vicky do you want to ask uh, in terms of uh, a research program mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you so much for that talk. Jochen. I, I found it really fascinating. So, um, you know, one of the things I've always struggled with is um, how to make my research programmatic. And I'm just wondering whether you had any tips and uh, ideas about how we might go about that rather than opportunistic, for example. Thank you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Vicky. Um, mm. Yeah, this is a, it's a this is a great <laughs> an important question as well um I, I can only share my kind of my personal approach to it and that that but that might be quite idiosyncratic to my own kind of personality and so on i'm not like the most structured person in the sense that i plan like 10 years ahead or something like that and have it all laid out so when i say programmatic that's not what i mean in my case but i do um um over time you know, I did come more like partly also out of necessity, you know, as a PhD student, I got involved with more different research projects and so on and working with faculty and learning different things, you know, I, and I did more research in other areas as well. And over time, I felt I cannot sustain so many different research directions. Um, and I also felt like, um, well, it's kind of you know, inefficient to start 
a new paper on a research new research topic all the time because you know the learning costs at the beginning are so steep right to, to read into a literature and so on so it was more like over time i realized too this, this is not sustainable this is not feasible so i need to kind of narrow it down and i think like, what what are the things that i care most about uh, right again in terms of the research and practice and the combination and then i kind of focus on that and, and reflecting on that and think okay well, this is something i really care about and then uh, in this area i'd say mindfulness and then it's partly driven um within that area what do i care about right uh, so and but partly also opportunistic in sense that you know you go to a conference you talk with other people and you say hey why don't we re do research on that right they say okay it, it's it, it's still broadly part of my area right uh, uh the mindfulness so that's great um but then i was also looking for opportunities more specifically for example to study leader mindfulness as a topic that i find interesting because it's about interpersonal side it's not just about what does mindfulness do for me but also how does it influence other people if a leader is more or less mindful could there be some kind of a multiplier effect and so on so i was on the lookout for projects like that and on the lookout also means looking out for collaborators right because Typically, we don't do research by ourselves, right? I mean, I, you know, mostly almost, almost all of my papers are together with others. So I always need to find also collaborators, whether these are PhD students or, you know, uh, collaborators from other universities and so on. So, and then it's kind of like that. So I kind of know I want to do this in the long run and I have certain topics, but when it comes to the specific projects, I, I don't have like a master plan that I would say, oh, I know I want to do this next and do that next. I'm more like having, you know, conversations with other possible collaborators and see how can we find an interesting topic. And as part of that, coming back again to the issue of impact also in publishing, one thing I, I, I did learn to do more over time uh, that works for me is kind of asking very early on, in addition to this being interesting topic for us to study, does it also have potential as a good publication? and kind of being realistic about it, right? And not being too overly positive and optimistic, just because we find it interesting, it's gonna be easy to publish, right? So I try to do a kind of more reality check. Okay, we might really find it interesting, but uh, how would the journal react to that? What kind of journals could we, cons could, could we think, could we imagine publishing this? And if we can't think of many, <laughs> then maybe not do that kind yeah. of research, right? Uh, and maybe find a different project within the same area, right? Uh, that's still part of the program. Yeah. Does that if, if I'm allowed, uh, if the time permits, may I? Please go ahead. Yeah. In fact, uh, with experimental method, I've been, you know, uh, I found it comparatively easier to publish. When we use mixed mm -hmm. method or qualitative methods, using you know extensive uh, research of scriptures trying to relate it to mainstream management and sending it to mainstream journals you know uh, it's pretty challenging because uh, you know mainstream journals look for more of you know quantitative kind of research so i would like to seek your advice or maybe you could share your experience that uh, we did publish but then as you mentioned you know it's not necessarily uh, in the kind of journals you would like to send it to, even the PhD scholars, you know, they did publish in the back factor mm. journals, but not the ones you would like to send to. Mm. Any advice on that? Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I um, hear you. Uh, I, in a way, I was lucky in a way that I like experiments, <laughs> you know, and that's how I started off, you know, even without being much aware, you know, of the. the you know whether that's easy or difficult to publish um i i do think you know not everybody has to of course fit the same mold right uh, and uh, again as i said i think there's so many excellent publications uh in, in in so many different journals right and then some you know and many excellent works especially also qualitative i say yeah, yeah don't make it into the top journals partly because not sure it's a bias or whatever it is it could be right because it's not considered as so rigorous um that that is unfortunate um on the other hand we see that a lot of the most popular and impactful papers are qualitative papers right uh, uh at the same time right even though not so many but oftentimes they can be quite impactful so 
you know, I, so I, when if you're a qualitative researcher, then I would say just emulate again that the look at there are qualitative papers in top tier journals, right? And so I would take a very careful look at these, right? If if you want to publish in top tier journals, uh, whatever journal you want to publish in, take a look, try to find the papers in there that have the method that you want to use, right? And and so that may be better right for some of you might also think okay maybe i want to do more i so i care about this topic so much but my qualitative research is not getting it enough <laughs> you know uh recognition as i'd like to uh maybe i need to find some co-authors uh they have more methods expertise in other areas and work together on some using a different method or using a combination of different methods right that could be one option or it could be well let me look at some of the qualitative papers in that journal and even though they're different topics, but let me try to figure out how are they written, right? What makes them appealing to this journal? Why did they get into this journal? And can I do something similar, right? And that's, that's things I think you could do. Obviously, that, that doesn't guarantee it, but I think that could be something to, to try out and it could be helpful. Ultimately, I also feel like, again, with the practice side, the nice thing is that you can get recognition from practice from others. Right, um, you know, um, so you're not fully only dependent on you know the scholarly community, although that's important to us. But you also have a different community to speak to, like practitioners, uh, right, and on that 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 might love your work, right? Uh, um, even though you know, and they couldn't care less where it was published, and right? they make their own judgment. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if Daniel Chung uh, uh, got asked his question. I had the feeling Daniel answered his own question. Question. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 All right. Okay. But Daniel, do come on mic if you'd like uh, anything further. Uh, I'm, I'm just merely observing and learning. Right, uh, mindfulness is really such a new topic to me, and it's the first time hearing these words, to be honest, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but uh, from observation point of view, um, seeing from organization perspective, I think it has uh, it's, uh, it, it's a place in organization environment, certainly. Uh, especially when we're actually dealing with leadership, and how do we manage ourselves, uh, especially our emotion? How do we manage our emotion before we talk to our our coworker, our employee, right? Because there's times when we are in the office when we're managing very tough project, our own emotion get disturbed, and we don't know how to learn how to control it. We may lead on to something not so positive in the working environment. So I see mm -hmm. that mindfulness could be a way to help uh, uh, managers to manage themselves so that they are able to communicate clearly, mm -hmm. especially those of them who are involved in a uh, tough project environment, uh, in, in mm -hmm. uh, project management. That is mm -hmm. my observation right mm -hmm. now. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. know whether I've answered my own question or I'm just merely mm -hmm. making a statement, right? right, just for sharing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. I agree. You know, um, just very briefly, when I first kind of introduced this to managers and senior and leaders and so on, I was, of course, anxious because it had been more tested out in more clinical context. So I wonder how they react to it. But then I was positively surprised. They reacted very, very, very positively, right? And they could relate to it very well. They, they struggle with their time management, right? Attention overload, emotional issues, partly work family interface, right? Uh, so busy with work. <laughs> little time for family and how to manage that, right? And different kind of relationships. And uh, another surprise was that the more senior they are, the easier they, they seem to be relating to mindfulness. It's the undergraduate students, they have a harder time. They're full of energy. You ask them to kind of sit down, write down, and they, they're not, you know, they're different life stage. But once they're like hitting, you know, 40s, 50s, <laughs> they really like that, this idea, oh, give me a quiet minute, yes. <laughs> so it's kind of, sometimes you also have these surprises along the way, unexpectedly, right? That can be nice. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Jochen, and thank you to all the uh, participants as well for uh, asking such a range of interesting and provocative questions. We're also engaging in some epistemological kind of discussions in the chat there, which doesn't always happen, so that's kind of wonderful <laughs> to see. Um, 
and I have to say, you can, you know, um, so much of your work, you know, it's, it's both about the kind of the quality of the scholarship, but also the importance of practice and also bringing your own passions and values in, into the work that you do, which I think is so important for, for what we're all doing and what we're all trying to achieve here. And I have to say, you know, you're talking there about work-life balance. I should tell everybody, I should confess on your behalf that you're supposed to be on a family holiday right now <laughs> in Germany. <Yeah>. And, <laughs> but because of your passions, you very kindly agreed to participate in this event for us. But we are going to let you go back to your family now and, <laughs> and not make you uh, wind you up in, for, for an entire uh, day uh, uh, yeah. from your holiday. Um, but what I would like to do is, is if, if please, if everyone could unmute their mics and actually give Jochen a real round of applause that he can hear and appreciate. So please do join me in doing that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Johan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Please enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you so much. And we're going to turn now to our editors panel. Um, I saw that all the editors were here. So um, hopefully that will all happen now seamlessly, that they'll be able to join us in the spotlight. Yeah. Um, so with the editors panel, we have five um, wonderful um, participants who are going to talk to us a little bit about uh, publishing and about their specific journals that they're representing. Um, we have Michelle Greenwood from Monash University, who's the co-editor-in-chief of Journal of Business Ethics. Michelle, welcome. We have Colin Higgins from Deakin University, who's the co-editor of Business and Society. Hello, Colin. We have Oliver Lush from Manchester University who's the Associate Editor at the Academy of Management, Learning and Education, AMLE. Ralph Barkemeyer from Kedge Business School in France, who's the co-editor of Business Ethics, the Environment and Responsibility, BEER, which has that wonderful acronym. And Pramila de Cruz from IAM Amnabad, who's the Section Editor uh, for Labor Relations and Business Ethics at the Journal of Business Ethics. Um, really a, a wonderful wealth of experience and insight that the that our panelists can bring to the discussion today. And we have a slight change in format to what we initially advertised for the session because we had so many people signed up and we've got 84 participants. Currently, we decided not to move into breakouts in the second part of the editors panel. We're gonna just have a regular Q and A in plenary just as we did with, with the keynote. Um, so we're going to have uh, about the first half will be me asking a few questions and the editors introducing their journals, giving us some insights into how they work. And then in the second half will be opportunity for you all to ask questions and uh, to get some insights into whatever it is you want to know about you know, the process of publishing uh, and all the different aspects that may come into that. So I've asked the, the editors just to give us a, a very brief introduction to their journal initially, uh, just for a few minutes each. So uh, we're going to start, I think, with the Journal of Business Ethics and Michelle, um, although you've just disappeared. Oh, there you are, uh, <laughs> finding your pen. Um, so Michelle, uh, over to you first for a quick intro into JBE. Okay, I was told I was allowed one slide. That's right. And I've spent all day trying to decide between the qualitative slide and the quantitative slide. Anybody mm -hmm. who knows my research, I have a very, very, very strong, you know, draw to the to the qualitative. So just to surprise you all, I'm just going to share my quant slide. And this is about as quant as I get, so don't get too excited with it. Oh, actually, <laughs> um, let me just, advanced screen, okay. So for you real quant scholars, of course, quant scholars, of course, this is barely quant. Um, I, think th I think that'll work. It's not exactly the full slide, but so you, can, you should be able to see my aqua colored slide. Um, okay. Except now I can't see you because I've lost my Zoom. Oh dear, hang on, you'll have to just give me a <laughs> slide by my Zoom. Okay. Um, Okay, I'm hoping that you're not seeing my shopping list, but you're seeing um, a slide that describes um, just a 
just a little bit about the Journal of Business Ethics. I'm very fond of describing the Journal of Business Ethics as being big, broad, but also bold. And I'll try and explain that using these just very brief characteristics, uh, as I said, on the quant side of, of the journal. The journal is big, there's no doubt about it, and I guess that that's its strongest reputation um, in, internationally. Um, we get uh, about 3,000 submissions a year, and we publish about um, 300 papers per year. We have 28 issues per year um, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that comprise for uh, seven volumes. So there are four, four issues in a volume. So, so big sort of goes without saying, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about how it is big. We have 58 editors on our um, editor team. So we have 58 uh, consulting editors, associate editors, and specialty editors who, who come from 15 um, different countries. And so, this is where our breadth starts to come in and we have a diversity amongst our team. And um, I hope Pramila will be able to speak a little bit uh, to that um, uh, when she does uh, also speak about the journal. We are um, uh, broad in our disciplinary manner. Well, there was a very significant focus on philosophy. We now have sections on um, accounting and business ethics, on sociology and business ethics, on economics and business ethics, on um, um, uh, critical studies and business ethics. So we have a very, very broad disciplinary base, but we also engage with a very broad range of business ethics topics. So we have sections that specialise, for example, in the environment, in sustainability, in corporate governance. Um, so um, our many sections and section editors are expert across this very broad range of disciplinary areas. We also try to be quite bold in our um, approach towards uh, convention or perhaps even lack of convention. Even though we're a large journal and of course we have to have some protocols, we pretty much see all our rules as a work in progress and so we encourage authors to ask questions both um, within their research, within the content of what they send to us, but also um, uh, ask of us if they, if they want to, to inquire, uh, to, 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 to formulate inquiries that push boundaries. And so um, uh, you may find, you know, some, some fairly traditional or conventional material published in the journal, but you'll also find some radical um, uh, material and, and, um, uh, and scholarship published in the journal. Um, again, this does speak to both our being big and broad, um, the conversation that we were just having around qualitative and, and quantitative, and, and um, I do empathize, empathize with the idea that there is some, some types of scholarship that are much more difficult to get published than others, for us, that's not really an issue at the Journal of Business Ethics because um, we really do cater, have expertise and have significant interest in a very broad range of scholarship. So um, we, may we may publish an autoethnography, which has been, um, you know, deeply, um, a, which is deeply political and deeply personal, or we may publish a um, a, 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 qualitative, a quantitative paper with an N in the tens of thousands. Um, so we're really a home for all types of scholarship, as long as it's on business and ethics. And, um, uh, and surprisingly, many of our um, uh, out of scope papers, papers that get rejected for being out of scope, do so because they don't treat ethics as central. And this is where we do have um, um, uh, some stickiness. This is really where we do um, uh, enforce our uh, vision of the journal, which is the slide I have chosen not to show you. So I'll leave it at there for the moment and very happy to answer any questions about the Journal of Business Ethics or to talk just about um, publishing in general. In particular, let's talk about um, um, flexing the boundaries and, and doing some unconventional uh, things in publishing. Super, thanks so much, Michelle. Um, journal of Business Ethics. Uh, publishes papers on business ethics. Who would have thought it? But it, obviously that, that can be a challenge for, for some people in terms of submissions. Um, Colin, uh, Colin Higgins from Business and Society. Let's hear from you next. 
Thanks, Andy, and uh, thanks, Michelle. I didn't prepare a slide, so um, I'll just talk about some of the facts and figures and also just some of the philosophy and some of the vision behind business and society as well. Michelle mentioned that uh, JBE publishes work in business and ethics, and of course, it follows from that that our scope and our focus is business and society, and I'm looking forward to unpacking that a little bit as we go. In terms of some of the facts and figures, business and society has been around for 60 years. It was founded in 1960, um, and of course, we've just recently um, published our 60th anniversary special issue, which is a little bit about looking back on the field taking stock of where we are now and looking forward. And it's a really interesting time to be thinking about what this relationship and the interplay between business and society looks like and how that defines some of the scope of the work that we do and how that's grown over time. So JBE is very big, <clears throat> business and society has been growing. So to put that into context, in 2021, we tipped over the 1000 submissions um, per year mark. And to put that into some kind of context, less than a decade ago in 2014, we received only 275 submissions. So the journal has grown very, very substantially over the last decade. And in part, that's because of the growing esteem of the journal, high impact factor, the quality of our editorial board, the quality of our reviewers, and so on. But I think more significantly in terms of the question about scope, it also talks to the extent to which the issues around business and society have become much more mainstream. They've become much more part of the conversations that organizational scholars in a whole range of different disciplines are having. So we are seeing that growth. That comes with some challenges. It comes with some challenges in terms of defining the scope, understanding the scope, and to Michelle's point about where the field goes from here. So events like this are really um, exciting for us to start to hear about the new conversations and the new thoughts and what that looks like for the field, where the field's going, and the shape of the field. Um, our acceptance rate's you know, kind of low-ish. It's around 4 to 6%, and mostly that's because of challenges around scope and challenges around the theoretical contribution, and also just questions about the coherence and logic, or perhaps to put it in um, Jockin's terms, where the passion around the publication sits, where that lies, and how that connects to the motivation for the study. And I think we'll have some time in the Q&A to unpack that um, a little bit more. So one of the important things that I do want to share with you is just how we make sense of the scope of this journal. And 60 years, as I mentioned, gave us the opportunity to look back somewhat. In 1960, when the journal started, conversations about business and society, corporate responsibility, the responsibilities of managers, who managers were and what they did and what was legitimate for them to consider was quite uh, nascent. It was uh, CSR was quite a fringe activity. This was the journal that was on the outside of the conversation looking in. And of course, now as the issues have become much more mainstream, we've started to critique a lot of what we see happening in terms of business and its impacts on society. So scope is really important for uh, pitching work to us and understanding that idea of implications. So what are the implications for managers? What are the implications for organizations of all of those things happening out in society? How do managers make sense of those? How do managers react to those? How do managers shape some of those sorts of things as well? Which pushes us back to that other side about what are the implications of business activity, business strategy, the way businesses are organized, the choices that they make on society, how we live, how the communities operate and how the communities function as well. And those dual, as uh, uh, Editorial Insight edit, uh, put together by Andy and, and the previous editorial team articulated in terms of the business relevance test and the social relevance test, the most important part of that is the interplay between those. What is it that actually happens at that point of intersection for business and its impact on society or the things that society is doing and its impact on structures, strategies and organizing and so on. And the second part, which is really important to us is what a theoretical contribution looks like. What is the so what? Why should we care? Importantly, perhaps for where, uh, for the work that you're doing is why do you care? about what it is that you're writing, what's motivating your study, and how is that connected to a conversation? So I like to think about 
business and society as being a bit like a party. And there's a whole lot of conversations going on in this room. When you walk into a room, there's conversations going on at the front, there's conversations going on at the side, there's conversations going on at the back. You're coming into that party, walking up to those clusters, those groups of people talking, and you're going to start talking. But you're probably going to listen first. You're probably going to listen to what the conversation is that's going on in that group between those members at that party. And you're going to contribute to that conversation. You're going to perhaps disagree with some of their assumptions. You might have some other evidence from your experience that um, takes that conversation in a different direction. And the journal is a bit like that as well. There's a whole lot of conversations going on, metaphorically speaking, of course, in the literature that you're adding something to. The, to extend the analogy, we don't just walk into a party, walk up to a group of people and just start talking. We actually listen for a while, we read the literature, we understand what's going on, and we share our perspective, marshalling some arguments along the way. And that's where that theoretical contribution comes from, that way in which you're extending a, an existing conversation in some way. So really looking forward to unpacking that um, as we go through the conversations today. Thanks, Andy. Thanks so much, Colin. And, and via the magic of Zoom, we will transport ourselves from Australia over to Europe, I think, now. And uh, perhaps Ralph Barkemeyer, another one of the specialist journals in our area, tell us a little bit about beer. Sure. Morning. Uh, I've got one slide, which you should be able to see now. Yep. A bit cheeky. Um, so if you really reduce the font size, then you can get a lot of stuff onto one slide. Um, I'll just use it as a background, basically. So um, business ethics, the environment responsibility, you, you may or may not have heard of us. Um, we're not one of the leading journals in the field, but we, we're aspiring to become one. Um, and we've um, done reasonably well in recent years in, in, in terms of um, submission trend, download trend, impact factor. Um, we, we're trying to become an ABS three star um, along the way. So we, we, we're trying to develop in, into one of the leading journals. Um, we used to be called Business Ethics European Review, um, also abbreviation beer. We, we like the abbreviation. So we, we just try to find something that, that still matches that, changed the title in 2021. Um, Main reason, we're not exclusively about business ethics and we're not European in scope. We, we are very much trying to be global in scope. And um, so we, we, we uh, updated our scope and the title recently also to account for the fact that we, we were positioned at the intersection of business ethics, environment sustainability and, and uh, uh, CSR. Um, so that, that was, the, the stuff we got anyway from our authors um, to, to a certain extent, irrespective of the previous scope. So we, we just uh, um, adjusted that in a way. So we are very open. We are a bit more junior than, than business and society and general business ethics. Uh, we've been around, um, so the old title has been around since 1992. Um, but then we, we really in, in more recent years have developed uh, uh, reasonably quickly the impact factor now is in the area of 5.1 um, we get we, we're tiny compared to the other two we get about 500 submissions uh, per year these days we're not as brutal as the others in terms of acceptance rate but but still um it, it's not that easy to to publish it beer either um so the the acceptance rate in the area of 13 percent typically um a couple of things I'd like to highlight. We, we aspire to be um, inclusive and developmental. Of course, any journal in, in this field should aspire to do that um, because we're not, we're not on the FT list. We're not in uh, ABS three star yet. And so we, we, can be, we can afford to be a bit more flexible, um, but yeah, not to say that the others are not developmental by no means, but uh, we, we, so the, the nature of submissions we get tends to be a bit, a bit different from business and society in general of business ethics. One section I would like to highlight just to conclude. Um, so we, we've got our regular issues, um, four per year plus the odd special issue. Um, we recently 
started with a discussion paper section called Beer Heterodoxies. Um, and the idea of that section is very much to uh, promote shorter contributions, which can be a bit controversial in, in nature, challenging existing thinking in the fields of business ethics, the environment and sustainability and, and, and corporate social responsibility. So things that don't really fit the conventional way of, of writing a paper um, might fit with our heterodoxy section. Um, good start so far. Um, do check us out. We're published by Wiley. Um, that's probably already the, the three or four minutes uh, I was allowed. That's great. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ralph. Um, and so far we've been listening to kind of specialist journals in the area that all focus on ethics, responsibility, et cetera. We're gonna turn now to uh, Oliver, who's gonna to talk to us about AMLE, which is a more, in some ways a general management journal, but focused on the education aspects in particular, which for many of us in prime is a key aspect of, of much of our practice. Well, for many of us for, for our research as well. So Oliver, tell us a little bit about AMLE. Yes, uh, thanks a lot, Andy. I, I very much enjoyed listening to the other journals and actually the uh, the opening line you just uh, stole from me there that uh, we're a different type of journal. Um, that, that's particularly important because um, the uh, um, one might think that maybe AMLE, uh, um, because it, it doesn't have ethics, responsibility or sustainability in its title, isn't a very fitting outlet. However, if you look at the published papers, I, would, I haven't done the math, um, but uh, from a gut feeling, I would say that probably one third, maybe even half of the papers do have some ethics, responsibility or sustainability angle, um, although it's not in the, the title. So I think that's important to consider. Um, so uh, I'm one of the associate editor of the journal. We have, uh, I think, eight or nine associate editors. The editor in chief is Paul Hibbert. Um, the, uh, all of the associate editors have different specialities and mine happens to be responsible management, learning and education. And this is why uh, most of the, uh, the, the manuscripts that relate to that theme um, end up on my desk. Um, so my perspective here is, uh, is less that of um, the journal editor, editor, but rather that of an associate editor and of um, the, the kind of process through which those type of submissions typically run. Um, however, I do want to give you an overview of uh, main aspects of the journal, um, although the acceptance rate is rather low, of course, it varies from year to year, but I remember the last one communicated was a little bit lower than 5%. Um, still, the, 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 the journal is very de developmental, and I have to say uh, most of that is really due to, to Paul's great work at the early stages. Um, Every third paper or so I, I get is uh, has gone through a reject and resubmit stage where Paul very, very extensively gave feedback to the authors if the paper did fit into the journal scope, um, saying what they could do in order to improve their submission so that it has better chances to go through the review process and um, to basically fix the obvious things that would be difficult uh, or endanger the, the submission later on. So I think that's a very important thing to highlight and, and an encouragement um, to submit to the journal, although the, the, the final acceptance rate might not be extremely high. Um, in terms of the themes that we are we're covering, uh, as the title says, management, learning, and education, um, I always uh, cringe a little bit if I, if I see the, uh, uh, the, the learning in organizations part, because I must admit, from the published papers, that's not our, our main focus area. Most of the papers are in the academic higher education context, which doesn't mean if you have a paper that otherwise fits into the journal and that's uh, management learning in organizations, you shouldn't submit it. I'm not saying that, but uh, the typical papers and the conversation going on in the journal is more on the academic education side. And I think that's also where it fits very, very well with the, uh, the UN Prime uh, emphasis. Um, something that's special uh, if you compare AMLE to the other management education journals is that there's a very um, pronounced emphasis of the business of business school. So you could almost say AMLE is not only an education journal, but it's also an organization studies journal, but focused on that particular type of organization that is the business school. 
um, and that includes very uh, uh, explicitly the, um, the management educators themselves, or more broadly, academics and academic work in business schools. So uh, I've, I've seen that one of the papers I will discuss with the authors later on, for instance, has that emphasis of working with empirical material from, uh, from educators. So that would be a typical journal that, a uh, typical paper that would fit into AMLE as a journal. Um, in terms of the rankings, uh, I believe part of the uh, the high high rejection rate is that uh, very recently we have been upgraded. If you want so, it, it has been it has been a four ABS four um, journal for quite a while, and then uh, um, surprisingly to me, but not because I didn't think we have it in us, but rather because there's so few journals, it was uh, popped up into that four star uh, uh, caps ranking, um, and and of course that in the other lists we're quite well ranked as well. It's not an FD50 journal though, we have to say that. Um, so if you're thinking instrumentally, if FD50 matters well, um, that, that's not uh, necessarily your main, main journal. If you're in the, the British or in the, uh, uh, the Australian system, well then that's probably quite a good bet if you're thinking instrumentally. Uh, main sections, we, uh, we are very open and everybody says that I know, but, but very we are, are really very open uh, in terms of the type of research that, that is being published. So in terms of research philosophies, uh, methodological preferences, um, I can't think of anything in particular that would be out of the scope. Um, actually in, in the next, uh, in, in the December edition, um, I, I, I lead authored a, uh, an editorial that very explicitly calls for all kinds of different ontologies, um, uh, views on what, what management learning actually is, also the, the, the much less, uh, the less common ones. Uh, and that then, of course, reflects into the empirical papers that we publish. By no means, it's, uh, uh, it, it is centered on quantitative papers. I would say quantitative and qualitative are actually there in equal proportions. We have a little bit uh, of fewer conceptual papers, which I think is a general phenomenon across most journals. Um, we do have the essay section, uh, which has been uh, boosted very, very much, uh, among others, because Paul Hibbert, before uh, becoming the editor-in-chief, he was the uh, associate editor of the essay section before, and he has escaped, uh, shaped the, the essay section very much. Um, what we're looking for is uh, what, what Paul calls uh, discipline provocations, um, so very strong viewed uh, opinionated types of essays, which are still grounded in a very strong um, uh, kind of liter literature base and which build a very strong argument in order to arrive at that opinion. Um, and another, another part, another section that is very strong are the resource reviews because we are an education journal. Um, although having a very, very strong focus on the theoretical contribution in the resource reviews, we are more centered on uh, the practical value of the resources being reviewed. So resources uh, could be anything from uh, uh, MOOCs, I did a MOOC review once myself, to traditional uh, book reviews uh, onto certain simulations. So anything that you're using in the classroom, any resource that you might be using in the classroom. And here the, re uh, the review process is slightly different as well because those are reviewed by um, the, the associate editor. So it's not a blind review process, uh, but in consequence also it is uh, a little bit less onerous and demanding to publish um, your views there than it is in the other one. So it's really a question of what you want to do with your time. Um, so, and then uh, this, those two resources that I mentioned here, they're not explicitly from AMLE, but uh, they come out of my work uh, receiving the, uh, the, the, the responsible management learning education submissions at AM, AMLE, which I've noticed that a common, um, I want to say weakness or, or, or an unused opportunity is that many of the papers that call them safe self that use that label responsible management education, for instance, don't ground their work in the very, very well-developed responsible management education literature. Um, so for, for a while now, I've been um, uh, uh, kind of every time I spotted a new publication, which explicitly uh, uh, fed into the literature, I've put it onto those two lists, which I will share in the, um, in the chat window a little bit later on as well. Um, because I think they are really a terrific uh, resource if you want to position your paper very particularly in the responsible management learning education uh, um, uh, field. And, and often because 
um, publications about that topic have been published so widely across different outlets, it's difficult to kind of put your finger on what, what the state of the field is and, and hopefully using those resources might be helpful. Um, so that's it overall from me. Um, please feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to further questions, particularly about the publication process that would be interesting uh, to discuss. Great. Thanks so much, Oliver. Um, and it's just, you, you will see there are some questions in the chat, some of which you've probably answered through your comments already, but uh, you may want to also uh, answer some of those directly in the chat as well so that we can uh, deal with those a little bit kind of on the side. Um, Pramila, I want to turn to you. Um, as I said, you're a section editor at, at JBE, but also you're, you're based uh, out here in, in Asia, in South Asia. And given that so many of our participants today, this is the ASEAN Plus uh, chapter of Prime, so many people are based out in Southeast Asia. Um, for, for people who are from you know, outside of, if you like, Europe and North America or Australia, um, what's the kind of particular challenges do you think they might face in publishing in a journal like JBE or any of the others? Or are there also some potential kind of opportunities or advantages that, that people from the region may bring? Any thoughts? Yeah, um, I would say, so let me start with the opportunity since it's always good to start with something more positive or maybe end with something more positive, but I'll do both. So I think, um, okay, I think I'll qualify the answer. I think publishing in any journal, particularly the top tier, if you're talking about say the FT50 or the ABDC, A stars, A or the ABS, you know, four or three. Um, I think what's really, and even Bs, you know, or even twos in ABS, honestly, I think the quality of publishing and the expectations are just gone much higher in the last decade or in the last five years. I think the issue is really to have a paper which is, you know, theoretically and methodologically sound. And I think when one has got that in place, that then that takes care of a lot of things. Now, having said that, I would say that, um, you know, the challenges that a lot of people in, you know, in Asia, particularly if you're from a globe or in the rest of the world, particularly if you're from a global South country, is probably the training and the exposure. And, you know, if one, as I think one of our colleagues um, mentioned that, you know, read, the, I think it was uh, Jochen, read the papers in the journal you're targeting, look at how it's done, look at the quality. I think that in the absence of having a mentor or in the absence of having, you know, the opportunities for training, I think that kind of reading over and over again uh, is very helpful and then you know drafting a lot and then if you can at a conference for example connect with any scholar it may or may not be an editor or a co-editor but anybody who can help you by giving you developmental feedback that is also helpful so I think the main challenge is really uh, you know the training the exposure which I think to some extent with the uh, web and the availability of databases is to some extent taken care of um, and I think the other opportunity is that, you know, two things. One is I don't think um, the countries in the global south uh, are and the issues there are so well understood and captured. And there's a lot of responsibility, I would say, that, you know, scholars like us have to really represent these issues to the larger world so that they can understand it from a more an insider point of view, uh, you know, um, and to do that, I think, crafting the paper uh, with good conceptual and methodological sort of, um, you know, um, anchoring is really the way to go. So I don't think just, you know, saying that it's never been studied in this particular context, no, that's not good enough. It may not have been studied, that's true. But building that around a theoretical framing, a conceptual framing, and showing the extension to scholarship, that's really where the key of it would lie. Yeah, I hope I've answered your question, Andy. Yeah, very much. Uh, I think it's, uh, it, it's so crucial that we can kind of bring out the opportunities, but we still have to, let's call them so, frame it in, 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 in an ongoing conversation and, and address the literature and find templates, if you like, as Jochen was, was suggesting about research that we've found inspiring as well. Um, Michelle, there's been some questions on, on JBE uh, in the chat, including how do you manage across all these different sections uh, and ensure there's kind of consistency, objectivity across them, for example. It's um, a great, that's really a great yeah. question and, and something that we, you know, we think a, a lot about. Um, the first thing that I would say is that um, 
uh, and this is my personal belief, and, and I'd be very interested to hear the other editors and, 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 and you in the audience as well, your opinion. I think that we spend too much time pretending that what we're doing is science, when a lot of it is art. And um, by that, I mean not just the work that we do, but our roles as editors. And we, you know, we spoke before about passion and Jochen's passion and, and, um, and most of us work in this area, these ridiculously long hours, giving free labor to these journals, doing all sorts of things because we are deeply dedicated. And so the fact that there is subjectivity, that we are ourselves involved um, in this research is actually key. So I don't think that we should diminish the concept of subjectivity. Importantly, we should also be experts as well as being subjective. And so we should understand the field very well and understand our own assumptions and biases with regard to it. And I think that if you come to a position like an associate editor, then I think it almost behoves you to be aware of your subjectivity and to take that into account. That doesn't necessarily mean to deny it, but rather to balance it with, um, for example, choosing a reviewer who you think is going to disagree with you or come from a very different perspective to you. And so I, I just wanted to say that I think subjectivity is given a bit of a bad rap. But having said that, there is still the question of um, uh, consistency and uniformity across a large group. And I think that is very important. And so while our um, editors, we really encourage them to be very independent and for those of you who have submitted to the journal or um, had much to do with the journal, you will know that when you submit to the journal as author, you in fact select which section the paper goes to. Now that doesn't mean it's not that's not stuck in 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 a solid. Uh, we have an internal system. If the editor receives the paper submitted to their section and for some reason feels that there would be another editor or another section better suited to um, that particular paper the paper can be transferred. But um, what is happening here is that we have, given the breadth and the very large nature of the journal, we have experts who are working in their own areas that no one person or even you know, several people could be right across. And so we have a lot of norm sharing. We spend a lot of time um, talking am amongst us about how we handle this particular problem. Um, how to fulfill this particular protocol. So we have a lot of communication, but we have a lot of autonomy in, in the editor group. And so um, uh, we'll never rule out the, all the diversity in the, in the team. We wouldn't want to, we couldn't because people are coming from some different areas. But what we're relying on our editors to do is to be very aware of their subjectivity and work with it constructively in order to bring their expertise to the paper and, and bring um, uh, a fair process to the paper. So I hope that answers that question, which I think is a really interesting question. I think exposes, when I describe the way we do it at the journal, a lot about the journal and the way that things are happening behind the scenes. Thanks, Michelle. One, one of the other questions that came up um, was around uh, or kind of one of the challenges that people face perhaps in the region is around lack of, of mentorship um, and kind of direct guidance and, and these kind of things. And I'm interested to know what role the, the journals can play in this. And, and, and most, I think all of you mentioned about being developmental and providing support for authors. Um, I wonder if you could perhaps elaborate on what that might look like. I mean, Ralph, what would happen at Beer in terms of being developmental and engaging with authors and helping their work uh, reach fruition? I think um, w one of the, the more subtle things would be that, that um, well, actually two things. Um, we, we mentioned the lists here and there. Um, we, we're not at the top of the food chain. Uh, we get a lot of Journal of Business Ethics rejects and we're fine with that in essence. Um, so it, we've got those five percent already gone in a way um, we we get a, a rather heterogeneous uh, a mix of manuscripts in, in in terms of um quality in terms of scope in terms of everything um we, we a couple of years ago um introduced also the, this reject and resubmit 
stage uh, that, that Oliver also talked about. I think that's rather important. Um, you, you have to, to take a decision at some point early on whether this manuscript is going to survive a review process or, or not. Um, but if it's still focusing, so if, if they're just fixable things that, that are just too time consuming for a regular review process, then I think that's a rather powerful option and, and that allows you to be m more inclusive and more constructive and more developmental than the, the regular process would allow you to do. Um, it, it just requires some work upfront then in, in the case of beer by the associate editor um, who, who would be providing the comments and, and, and then uh, the, the thing would go through the entire process at, at a later stage once more. And, and then it, it's very much about aspiring to be developmental, uh, I think. There, there are lots of cases where we're not. Um, the, the Michelle just talked about the partially subjective nature of the entire process. And I think that that's important to, to keep that in mind. Also, when we're, so mentoring is great, being inclusive is great. And so we, we shouldn't uh, ignore the fact that part of this is, um, how can I best put that? Um, well, luck is, is actually a, a, a rather important component as part of this. So if, if the the acceptance rate of a journal is 13% or 5% or something like that. It's not like we actually managed to identify the 5% best papers or the 13% best papers. There's always a struggle for consistency. Um, there, there will be, I don't know, rushed decision-making here and there, especially at, at the uh, desk reject stage uh, where then, well, you have to take a decision whether this is going to enter the review process or not. And, and some people get it wrong and, and things like that. So, yeah, um, and, and that also means just uh, in that case, not giving up, but trying elsewhere. Um, acceptance rates are very low. The processes are very inefficient in, in many ways and unfair and brutal. And, and it's just also a matter of, of keeping going. Um, Sorry, just wandering off, and so I'll stop here. No, great. I mean, that was one of Jochen's three Ps: is persistence, and I think that's absolutely critical given some of these characteristics, uh, kind of idiosyncrasies of, of the review process. Um, we have a question from PB in the chat. I'm not sure who PB is, but maybe if PB wants to come uh, on mic and uh, talk about this one, because it's a very interesting question about theory building and how can you be kind of introducing kind of novel kind of ideas or constructs into the domain. PB, are you there? Yes, thank you so much. I, I was wondering, I mean, how do you begin? Because, you know, when we send in papers, we always look at literature review and we try and figure out, okay, what are the accepted theories around CSR and sustainability? But if there is something new that we are coming across and we write about it, we test out models. We do get comments back from journals saying, you know, this is not as per accepted, uh, you know, norms or uh, what is already known. And therefore we uh, would like you to first bring about a paper on the theoretical aspects, think about how, which theory this would be. And a lot of, uh, you know, for example, I belong to India. So a lot of, uh, the work that is happening in the CSR domain also touches upon development economics. So it may not be the way that globally CSR is being looked at from a sustainability angle also. It's typically now only community-based work. So what kind of theories do we bring to the table to explain the work that is going on? Um, because I, I feel, you know, having had an economics background and a management background, that there is a huge interplay and in, uh, uh, an interface between the two. And especially developmental economics, and Amartya Sen's work, and Abhijit Banerjee's work, etc., talks about you know, for example, uh, evidence-based uh, you know work uh, happening in the education sphere, for example, in poverty, in inequality, and in all these aspects. So, how do we bring something like this to international journals like JB and others, and all the four? In fact, all four are really lovely journals, and I would like to, in fact, contribute in the future, but. How do we begin with a theoretical base? If you could elaborate on that, that would really help. Thanks, that's a great question. Colin, let me ask that one to you. I mean, you talked about this, this uh, showing up at a party analogy, 
But I think what PB is saying was, what, what if you've just been to another party where the conversation is much better, much more exciting, right? You've been talking about some really cool things. And, and so you walk into the business society party and you want to keep telling people, look, I was just talking about all this great stuff over there. It's really interesting. You guys need to listen to me about this. Hmm. Um, but your advice is, well, no, you have to kind of pull back and find out what the conversation is over here and then squeeze that interesting conversation into the what you might find is a fairly boring or predictable or kind of kind of accepted conversation that's happening already in the party. How do you do that? How do you bring this new stuff into, in, into the field like that? Yeah, it's a really great question. And I think, you know, it goes to the heart of perhaps a big challenge in the publishing world is that we probably do need to do, we probably do need to walk more of the talk in this, I think is, you know, we all did talk about being developmental and being inclusive and so on. Um, and probably, so then my, the first thing that I'm going to say probably seems counterintuitive to that, but to extend the analogy that um, Andy just uh, introduced into the into the question is, you know, maybe the first question to ask is, is that the right room to be in? Um, you know, do you have something to say to that conversation? Um, and if you believe that you do, then where is the, to come back to what Pramila said, where is the opportunity to pick up on a thread that's going on. There's a reason why you've gone into that party because there's people that you want to talk to or there's people that you've been reading about or there's conversations that you've heard. So what is it that, where, where do you find those linkages? Where do you take a conversation from the point where it is now to, in a different direction in a way that builds those bridges? It's not about um, having to be captured by those conversations that are already in the room, but intelligently working with what's there. So it might be in terms of developmental economics, it might be that you're listening to a conversation that's going on in that party and you're saying, yes, all that's very true until we look at these set of assumptions here, which introduce an idea or introduce a thread that extends in some way in a different direction the conversation or the existing work that's taking place in that conversation. But the other thing that I would say, perhaps a little bit more um, fundamentally, more as a, an author who does this type of stuff myself and le perhaps less so as an editor, but we don't need to know everything. Um, if you're wanting to publish in a journal, what are your theories? What are, where do you, st what territory do you stake out as being what interests you? You know, I heard somebody say once that as scholars, we should aim to learn everything about something, but something about everything. So what are what what do you know well? What theories do you know well? What are the what are, what are the mental what are, what are the cognitive frames? What are the concepts that resonate strongly with you that you are engaged in that help to motivate your work and encourage the work that you do and to motivate the new questions because it's that type of engagement at a deep level in a one or two theories that you learn and know well that helps you to extend that work. So I do, for example, I do a lot of work on institutional theory and, and, and other types of things. And I did a piece of work recently, which I was interested in why there were a whole lot of mining companies in Australia that weren't producing sustainability reports. So at face value, what we know about institutionalization is the big, dirty, naughty companies should all be producing sustainability reports. When we went and talked to them, what we found out is that the field looked quite different for this group of organizations. The field wasn't defined by industry, the field was defined by their strategic posturing towards sustainability. So because I knew that theory quite well, I could see the hooks and I could see the opportunities that I was able to extend through that empirical phenomenon. So the point of that story is you don't need to know everything. You don't need to know every theory. The challenge of publishing isn't about going out and saying, hey, I've got, with every single topic that I want to write on, I need to find a new theory. It's about really engaging with the work in your area, the theories that you know quite well, and finding those opportunities, finding those ways to talk a little bit differently or to challenge some of the assumptions or to move some of the sticky points of a perspective or a set of understandings along a little bit further. Um, and I think that we, we uh, and, you know, and I think then that also means that it's necessary to be 
focused in terms of the outlets where you publish as well. Not every journal is going to necessarily be ready for the contribution that you might like to make. So typically the material that you're reading will provide a pretty good start to where you want to place and position your work to extend that conversation and to make that type of contribution. Right. Thank you so much, Colin. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Colin. I mean, uh, this, this, this question of the uh, knowing what's the right literature to cite, knowing which conversation to enter into. I mean, Oliver, you very helpfully provided the links to some resources on what's what you regard as kind of core literature in, in your area. Um, which often isn't kind of in existence for many of us, given where, where, we, where we are in, in, in our field of business and society. Um, in, in terms of the, the kind of review process then, uh, thinking about say at AMLE or any of the other journals, how, how essential is that, that the kind of the locating in a literature and that being the right literature at the moment of submission, or how often does that change also through the review process as, as, as papers yeah. get developed? Because my sense is that the papers often look very different at the end to what they look like at the beginning. And even the contribution may be to a different literature than what you thought it might have been in the end. So how important is it the deep location in the literature or versus yeah. having something that's novel or original or, or kind of intriguing for an editor when, sure. when you receive a paper. Yeah, may, maybe counter to, to what I was saying earlier on about the, the need to, uh, well, not the need, but the helpfulness of um, uh, locating your work in that responsible management learning education literature, if this is where you want to make your contribution. I'm actually intuitively, I, I was, was thinking, well, great that you do have a very different field to come from and to see what can I actually import here that is of value. In the to, to kind of shake up the established discussions because when we go into very well established discussion we're first looking what are what are the things that people have been talking about for ages it's very difficult to find something new while if you are going in there with something that you think can be of value here and you're trying to find your connection point uh, to shake it up a little bit i think that's much more uh, attractive in terms of contribution potential it's also more difficult of of course, in terms of process, because you have to more, more, more legwork in order to get to that point where you make the connection. Um, I, in terms of the review process itself, I think this initial position for me always has two important roles. The first one is, um, and it's a very practical one, uh, if an editor looks at this, who are the people they're reaching out to? Who are the people they uh, draw into that process? And that can be very, very crucial, um, both in terms of um, what are your chances of, of your kind of argument to be liked by the people reviewing it. Because if you have those people already as very, very prominent references in there, well, most likely there, there will be some of your reviewers and they will be interested or at least open to what you have to say. Um, and, and also this kind of deviation where we, where we then end up with a completely different, different paper from the one that was maybe intended in the position. I think that is often because the original paper might not have very clearly positioned where they want to go. So the reviewers ended up being somewhere else. Maybe even the associate editor wasn't really a great fit for, for that kind of positioning. And they kind of steered the paper elsewhere, although maybe the initial positioning was just fine if there was a different set of people involved. So I think that's important. Um, and then the other one that we typically talk about, of course, is um, how can you uh, claim you contribute something against your original positioning? So you, you say what is out there and what people have said and uh, what do I actually have to bring? To, what can I bring to the table? So that's less about the, the review proce process and how pragmatic I am uh, uh, going about that, but rather about what is the final outcome and contribution of the paper and how can you claim a contribution against what you say is already out there? Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I think there's a... Sorry, I was just going to say, before we leave these conversations completely, um, with, with, I just wanted to add something with regard to um, oh. developmental um, resources at the Journal of Business Ethics, if, if I might. I just wanted to, to, to um, um, identify for, for our participants that at the Journal of Business Ethics, we don't um, use exactly the same system that has been spoken of by um, um, Colin and Ralph um, with regard to the 
um, I think it was Colin who, who mentioned the um, reject before, sorry, uh, reject and resubmit option. Um, we, we actually just don't have that at the Journal of Business Ethics. Rather, we have a um, revise before review option. And our editors do, do use that in many cases um, precisely for developmental purposes. And I just would like to explain that process. So what happens is if a paper comes to the to a handling editor at the Journal of Business Ethics, and they believe that um, for, uh, the, the, there may be a number of grounds that they may suggest that the um, uh, author be given an opportunity to revise according to developmental comments from them before they send to the review process. So similar to the um, uh, reject and resubmit, it's a chance for the authors to get a sort of a review before it goes into editor um, in, into the editorial process. And this is very often done because um, the author isn't aware perhaps of the conventions or the um, uh, nuances of the journal and yet um, because they may come from a, 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 a um, geographical area where their resources aren't as great and they haven't had the same sort of training and so or there may be a topic that is of deep interest to the journal something that's very important something that you know we haven't heard enough voices on and so it would be on those grounds that the um, editor may choose to use this process but importantly this process um, keeps the paper within the um, journal and uh, rather than um, uh, asking the author to resubmit entirely and therefore not have any security, um, the continuation of the original submission we hope sends a message to the um, uh, authors that we're uh, trying to assist them to get to, you know, the best outcome that they can get from the review process, rather than um, just giving them an opportunity to resubmit uh, um, uh, with our uh, feedback. And so um, uh, keeping the, the, um, the, the, the same, uh, it, it may seem like a small thing, but keeping the same number, keeping the same review process going um, is, 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 a, is, is our attempt to um, uh, have, a, have a sign of good faith in this regard. Um, I also wanted to tell you that we have actually an internal process where we provide um, access to a developmental editor, specifically, again, in these sorts of situations where we have a topic that we think is vital, a voice that we haven't heard enough from, um, perhaps um, uh, from regions, from types of scholars about, um, uh, you know, particular uh, groups of um, research uh, respondents. That, that we would like to have much more um, uh, um, space in the journal, we would like to see take up much more space in the journal. And, um, and our editors, if they really think that a, that an, uh, a paper can uh, benefit from development at the journal, can use our internal re referral system to a, a, an editor who is dedicated, all his, um, his entire um, work is in this, and Scott Taylor, who's also involved in this PRME um, initiative, um, who is our current developmental editor. So these are two specific things that we do to assist with developmental papers at the Journal of Business Ethics, which I think differs slightly from the other journals. And again, relates to our size and breadth that we can undertake these tasks. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. It's very helpful to, to hear that, I think particularly for, for many of our respondents. Um, we're about out of time, so uh, I, I know there are more questions. I can see a hand up uh, from Farah there and others, but we're not going to take any more questions. Um, we, what I would like to do, though, is just as we um, just to conclude this session, I want to go around each of you and just ask you to say one thing, one tip you might want to give to aspiring authors about what they should either definitely do or definitely avoid if they want to have some success in the publishing experience. Uh, so one tip only, each of you. Uh, Pramila, first to you. Yes, I think the most important thing I want to say is never give up, you know, the persistence part, because sometimes I think it's easy to get uh, sort of disheartened, but don't. And I think it's important to just keep trying with all the tips that you get when you come to PDWs like this and reading journals, because it does happen. And so that's my tip. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Ralph? 
Well, just brief, so that, that would have been mine. Thanks, Pramila. But um, maybe not to be too strategic. And Jochen was a great example where he, he just built his research over, an, and he was kind of 10 years early at the start. But then um, he found his outlets, he developed his trajectory. Um, so, first of all, just do what, what you're most interested in. And, and then Things will pan out, I think, if, if you're persistent. Good, thank you, uh, Oliver. Yeah, I, I would I would suggest to always think one rejection ahead, which sounds a little bit cruel, but um, for me it's worked quite well. Um, to like at the point in time where typically when I'm submitting to a particular journal, I always think what would be the the exit strategy. So if this doesn't work out, what's next? And to already shape papers in a way that makes them not a, a kind of one exit type of option. If it doesn't go here, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, so I think that would be, for, for me, that's worked very well in, in keeping a perspective and keeping a paper alive until it gets published after all. And sometimes it uh, goes very quick and, and other times it takes, it takes ages, sometimes it just doesn't, but I, I think that's helpful. Yeah, so I think, and, and behind that as well is, is one thing that Oliver's kind of saying, but not saying there is that, also, as editors, we all get rejected all the time with our work, right? <laughs> just because just because we know how the editing works and all these kind of other things, it doesn't make you immune to to the prospects of rejection. It's something we all face all the time. Uh, Colin, uh, probably at risk of um, preaching to the converted because you're all here, but take every opportunity to learn about what the journals are doing, what they're saying, the manuscript development workshops, speed dating at conferences with. Um, experienced scholars and so on get yourself out there read the journals do reviewing learn the process and just grab those opportunities with both hands great and michelle finally the last word um so i, I would uh, just throw in something different i agree with everything that's been said and that is to think deeply about the purpose of the paper you're writing so what is the problem that you're trying to solve and ideally it's a problem in the real world not a problem in the literature not that you know some somebody you know that some some theory is incorrect in the smallest of incremental ways and to really pursue that purpose to pursue it not just in the um, way that you design your study and the way that you write your paper but in your choice of journals and I think this uh, I think matches quite strongly what Ralph is saying about not being too strategic um, uh, I, th I think that keeping in mind purpose uh, of, of really what you're doing and, and, and why you're doing it. Uh, and I imagine that you, many of you have got very strong purposes. Great. Well, thank you so much to, to all of our editors, Pramila, Oliver, uh, Colin, Ralph and Michelle. It's been a wonderful conversation. I'm sure um, we'll carry on with, with some of these conversations in, in our next session, which some of the participants will be in if you submitted your work and you got accepted into the second part of the workshop. We'll be doing our kind of one-on-one -on -one direct feedback. So again, kind of taking advantage of some of these opportunities to develop our work. Um, and if you're not in that, but we will be doing more of these Prime World tours around the world. So there'll be more opportunities to do so, so that you can take advantage of some of these opportunities that, as Colin was mentioning. So again, if you would all, uh, uh, join me in unmuting and giving a big round of applause to our editors, please. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, all the editors, and thank you to all the panelists. This is a great session. <laughs> great. So we're going to take a break now. And um, for those who are joining in our next session, uh, we'll put up all the breakout rooms now. Uh, so, so you have the, the information, and we'll start at quarter past uh, wherever you are, quarter past two local time, uh, quarter past four local time, sorry. That, that is in 10 minutes from now or when is that? Yes. Yes, yes. I just want to uh, say I will put up uh, this uh, screenshot of uh, the 15 rooms and uh, allocation of the 15 rooms. So you just need to join into the rooms you have been allocated. It will be up when you get back. <laughs> Glad you made it in time, Doug. Me also very happy. <laughs> Just Thank walk you. into the room. <laughs>